I'm starting a new series today. Once dead, but now alive. I find this still the most important message. The most important message. You know, you can know all the theology and all the doctrine, right? You could cross every religious T and dot every religious I and you can be doctrinally perfect but still be dead. Still be dead. It is Christ who's come to live in us with a holy, heavenly life that transforms us. And within that life, my dear friends, we are all one. Be it a Jew or a Gentile, Galatians 3, 26, be it male or female, we're all one in Christ Jesus. Without him living in us, Christianity does not work. Without him living in us, we cannot deny ourselves and take up our cross. And then all we have is a life of struggle and failure because of the weakness of the flesh. But Christ has come as the life-giving power to empower us and enable us to live a holy, heavenly life. And that's what makes the church glorious. Christ in us, the hope of glory. And this is what God wants to give you. Renew in you daily, daily. It's not just, hey, I got saved 20 years ago. No, I got saved this morning. I got renewed in the inward man with this holy heavenly life. That's as silly as saying, I ate a meal 20 years ago and that sustained me. Anybody here would know that's silly. You got to eat every day. True. And the same is true with Christ. Jesus said, as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. So we're going to talk today and over the next few weeks about this. And I pray that this is not just information, but divine impartation. And that if we need awakening inwardly, if we need being made alive inwardly, to again taste, not just see, but taste that the Lord is good. Seeing is on the outside. Tasting is on the inside. God doesn't want you to just see his works. He wants you to live in the power of his work in you, making you new every day and giving you a life that overcomes the world, a life that triumphs and reigns over sin and over death and over hell and over all the power of the devil. The devil has no claim over anyone who's in Christ Jesus. None. He has no power over you. There's nothing he can do to capture you when Jesus is your Lord. And we need Jesus because the world is full of unclean evil spirits. But we are not going to bow before them or give them any access to our hearts and minds because we know we've been bought with the blood and are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Can I hear an amen? amen. Okay. Revelations chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. Oh, I could just talk this morning about the first statement. When I saw him, what a good day. Jesus, we will see. Oh, singing glory, hallelujah. We're going to see the Lord when he comes and splits open the eastern sky and in the flash of the split of an eye, wink, when we see him, we will be made perfect in his likeness as he will present us to the Father without blemish in his sight. What a reward of faith we will have that when we see the Lord, we will be like him. These are promises in the scripture. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. The original text says, I live in the everlasting of the everlasting life. Oh, praise God that we are all given this heavenly life through Jesus. I'm alive forevermore, amen. And I have the keys of Hades, the abode of the dead and of death. I reign. Thank God that Jesus Christ has the power now 
now, not someday. Now he has the power. And I've seen this power so many times in the face of death. Oh, I'm so grateful that I believe in this with all of my heart. Now, what I would like us to see this morning is actually very simple, but profound. You see, friends, it's not just an emotion. It's not just the feeling. Many times when we're maybe not as trained in our senses, then we kind of go with the emotion in our faith. Oh, I felt so much power. Oh, glory to God. I personally live there, amen. But there's something in me that is more forceful than the emotion, and that is the living word. That's the living word. You see, I want to show you today that it's according to scripture. And that when you maybe have feelings contrary to this life, when you have experiences contrary to the presence and power of the Lord, what do you do? Do you then all of a sudden not know what to believe anymore? And you kind of go, oh, oh, I felt the power of God, but now it's gone. Oh, God, oh, Lord, please don't leave me. Oh, Lord, please don't forsake me. No, my dear friends, he'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. One pastor called me and he said, Pastor, can you please pray for me because I don't feel the presence of the Lord. I said, what you are feeling is not the absence of the Lord, but the presence of the devil and he's a liar. And the moment I said it, that evil spirit that was there left and the person was crying on the other side of the phone and said, I feel him, I feel him, I feel him. But he's always there. But folks, this world is full of evil spirits that will lie to you. Their presence is deception and lies. And they will make you feel the Lord is not there. But you have got something inside of you that can arrest that lie and said, greater is he, he that's in me than he that's in the world. That's the word of God. You have the word as a lamp to your feet and a light to your path. You have the word living in you. One of the first signs that you are spiritually made alive is that the word connects with your heart and mind. Understanding comes inwardly. That's one of the signs that you are made alive is that when the word comes, you connect with it. Jesus said in John 5, 24, the reason you can hear me speaking God's words to you is because the life that is in me is manifesting in you, which shows you are no longer under God's judgment for you've already passed from death into life. It's the word, friends, by which we are born again. The Bible says we are born again or spiritually made alive by the incorruptible ever living word of God. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. And when we think about this, Jesus, right? Because some people say, yeah, I know what you say, pastor, but I, I just want to see it. I, I just want to see it. Well, go with me to Luke chapter 24, because I know some people say seeing is believing, but that's not true. Faith does not come by seeing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. That's how God ordered it. And it's by faith we live a new life. And that faith becomes the, the divine channel in your heart. Faith in your heart becomes the divine channel by which you live in the invisible, by which the invisible becomes visible in you, real in you. It's simply childlike faith. Jesus says, these powers of the new life are hidden from the wise and prudent, but they are revealed to babes. It's that childlike faith that begins to live in the everlasting life. And that faith is given to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. But here in Luke chapter 24, Jesus stood in their midst, verse 36 and said to them, peace to you, after his resurrection, after he was made alive from the dead. And they were terrified and frightened, and supposed they had seen a ghost, a spirit. And he said to them, 
Why are you troubled? <clears throat> Why do doubts arise in your heart? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is myself. Handle me, touch me, and see for, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Oh, am I grateful the Bible helps us believe. Because there are people that think that Jesus is just the spirit. No, my dear friends, the body that was laid in Joseph's tomb, that body after three days was resurrected and it saw no corruption. According to Psalm 16, that body saw no corruption. Why? Because he was without sin. And he conquered sin for us, for us. You see, he died for sin when we, through his power, can die to sin. None of us can die for sin. Why not? Because we, in our nature, have sin. And we cannot die for sin. But he knew no sin, and he died for sin to conquer its power through the spirit by which he offered himself. The spirit by which he surrendered himself to death was the eternal spirit by which he is God. And that spirit by which he offered himself to death was like sweet perfume to the Father. It was a sweet fragrance. Why is that so important? Because he, on our behalf, accepted the judgment against sin, which is death. He accepted it. He took the punishment. He said, yes, sin is worthy to be punished. And how? We all believe this. If somebody really violates you and it stirs up your anger, how you are compelled to want to get even? Come on now, be real. You want justice. And we should have justice, but you'll never find complete release of the sense of indignation against what's wrong, except at the cross of Calvary, because it was that spirit by which he offered himself, by which he offered his blood to God that completely appeased the law and appeased God's wrath. It appeased God's wrath against man's sin. That's where the word Propitiation comes from. Propitiation means peacing wrath, appeasing wrath. Jesus completely took away the wrath of God as he satisfied the law by accepting the punishment in full against sin by the spirit by which he offered himself. And thereby he not only broke the power of sin over human flesh, but he broke the power of the devil to accuse us of sin. You see, the devil uses the law to accuse us. And we all have failed to keep the law, if not by action, by nature. Jesus showed us in Matthew, he said, the law says do not commit adultery. But I say, he who looks after a woman and lust after her has already committed adultery in his heart. Adultery, my friends, is what happens in the nature of the heart. And Jesus shows what the law is to empower us, that we have an inward restraint against looking with familiarity at somebody else. But unless that law comes alive in your heart, you don't have the power to live that way. Jesus had that holy heavenly law written in his heart, and he satisfied it. Thereby, he took away Satan's power from being able to accuse us of doing any wrong. And he, having suffered the full punishment of sin in his own body on the cross, triumphing over sin and disarming the devil of any power to accuse us, rose triumphantly from the dead to now manifest a life that is free from sin, free from the fear of death, free from the power of the devil. And he is now that life. He is the surety of that life and imparts it into you and me without ceasing so that as he lives, we may live also. Amen. Amen. 
Thank you, my grandson says, amen. <laughs> I need to have you here more often to cheer me on. Thank you, sir. Now listen, Jesus is standing there, resurrected from the dead. He says, behold my hands and my feet were the marks of his suffering. He had seven marks of his suffering according to scripture. He says, behold that it is I myself, handle me, see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he had said this, he, by, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still, listen now, did not believe. They are seeing it, but they didn't believe it. Stay with me. For joy and marveled, he said to them, have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb and he took it and he ate it in their presence. You see, it's important that you hear this because some religions, they don't believe any of this. But this is what lies at the root that breaks the power of sin and death is that Jesus in the body that he offered rose triumphantly over death. He destroyed the power of death. And by that power, he set you free from the fear of death. Setting you free from the fear of death is not just a mental encouragement. Hey, don't be afraid. I am alive. I have the power over death. I have the... No, he does more than that. He comes to live in you with his triumphant life over death. And that is the power that you're not afraid of death that you can at that moment when it's your turn to step from the temporal into the eternal, you can look death in the face and you can say, you have no power over me. In thine hands, heavenly father, I commit my spirit and soul and you release yourself to go into the presence of the Lord. You know, a lot of people don't know this. That's why they so struggle and struggle and struggle and they just can't let go when their body's trying to let them go because the body's finished, but they just can't and they keep fighting to hold on because they're afraid. They're not just afraid mentally. They're afraid in the absence of this blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchased of God. I'm born of his spirit and filled with his love. This is my story. This is my song, praising my savior. They didn't believe. They saw and didn't believe. Verse 44, and he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. I love that statement. He's already on the other side, right? He's on the other side. That's what I call it. But he came and manifested himself on this side. And he said, this is what I told you when I was still on this side with you. Yes? And he spoke to you while I was still with you that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Again, he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. And that repentance and remissions of sin should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I sent the promise of my father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. This is where faith came into them and they were introduced to this heavenly life. How? Through understanding. The Holy Spirit through Jesus gave them in. Why is that so important? What does it mean to be spiritually dead? Most people don't understand. They don't recognize it when they are entertaining death. So they also 
don't really understand what it means to entertain eternal life. They do not see the difference. Moses said to the children of Israel, I place before you life and death. Choose. It is a choice, friends. God will hold each and every one of us to an account. Yes, death in its nature will express sin in the flesh. When you are dead in sin and trespasses, then you will have sin in your flesh ruling you as master. And your character and your nature will express itself in the nature of sin. You will have uncontrolled anger tantrums, lust tantrums, jealousy, envy. You'll have curiosity for demonic activity called witchcraft is a work of the flesh. You read these things in Galatians 5. And when these natures express themselves in your flesh, you are dead and you are not enjoying eternal life. Because to enjoy the nature of heavenly life in your flesh, you begin to experience God's love, God's peace, God's joy, God's kindness and goodness and faithfulness and, and so forth. And self-discipline where you go, no, nah, I'm not going to smoke. No, I'm not going to drink. No, I'm not going to live like I used to live because that life I have said goodbye to. I'm going to live in the Holy Spirit. I'm going to live to please my Father. It's real to you. And the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, what, that's, what it means to be spiritually dead your understanding, verse 18, is darkened because you're alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in you, because the blindness of your heart. Spiritual death, friends, is that you have no light of the life of God in you. Spiritually becoming alive is where the word of God is allowed. You give access to it. You welcome it into your heart. You welcome the word of God and you begin to experience a new birth. You begin to experience a new life inwardly in your heart. And understanding comes. Understanding comes. You begin to recognize and perceive God. And this is his spirit drawing you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Out of the control and dominion of sin and the power of devil into the union that Jesus has in heaven with the Father. And the life that he has in the Father in heaven is now coming into you. And it will keep coming as you keep opening your heart. And there comes such a heart into you, such a mind into you that we see in Jesus that you cannot bear to live separated from the Father. You cannot bear to go back to your old ways, not because you're afraid of judgment, but because the love of Christ compels you. Because you know if one died for all, then all have died. Therefore, we should live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died for us and loved us while we were yet sinners. We used to sing it, no turning back, no turning back. I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Sing it with me. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And if the world would all of a sudden offer you everything... You say, nah, I have found something more wonderful, more amazing. It's this life of the Son of God who makes me alive together with himself. Nah, 
I'm not going back. I'm not going back. And I don't know about you, but I'm so grateful that that love of my Savior, of your Savior, keeps compelling me to live as he lives, to the praise and the glory of God the Father. Friends, the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 15, we'll close with that thought. 1 Corinthians 15. I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you now stand. The gospel, the good news. By which also you are saved if you hold fast that word which I preached to you unless you believe in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to Scripture, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to Scripture. And when you begin to find these Scriptures that are here in the Bible, I read these scriptures and I can't get enough of it. I'll just read you from the New English translation. Jesus endured, Isaiah 53 verse 4, the suffering that should have been ours, the pain that we should have borne. All the while we thought that his suffering was punishment sent by God, but because of our sins, he was wounded. You see, the love of Christ comes into you to such a degree. You can't go back to that way of sinning, that way of acting, that way of talking. Why not? Because you can't bear the pain of grieving him. You can't act as if his sacrifice for you was not sufficient. You cannot act as if what he did for you was not enough to compel you to change. You can't anymore. It has such a hold of your heart. In what way? Oh, my loving Savior, my loving Savior, thank you for loving me when I was yet a sinner. Thank you. Thank you for your mercies. They are new every morning. I live within this thinking. Because of our sins, he was wounded, beaten because of the evil we did. And we are healed because of the suffering he suffered and were made whole by the blows he received. All of us were like sheep lost each of us going our own way, but the Lord made the punishment fall on him, the punishment all of us deserved. He was treated harshly, but he endured it humbly. He never said a word, like a lamb about to be slaughtered, like sheep about to be sheared. He never said a word. He was arrested, sentenced, let off to die, and no one cared about his faith, and he was put to death for the sins of our people. He was placed in the grave with evil men and buried with the rich, even though he had never committed a crime or ever told a lie. One more verse. And so I will give him a place of honor, said the Lord, a place among great and powerful men. He willingly gave his life and shared the fate of evil men. He took the place of many sinners. He prayed that they might be forgiven. Let's stand. I'm looking forward to share this series with you. You know, I really believe in a holy church. I do. The Bible, the New Testament calls us saints. I believe in a holy church. What makes us holy? The Lord himself, because there's none holy but the Lord. And what is holiness is to live in his love, in perfect righteousness with him. And that, folks, is not possible without Jesus. But this is the wonder of Jesus, my friends. He is the surety, and he is the one that imparts that life. And he will never cease to give it to you as long as you keep your heart open to him. And he will compel you by his love to turn away from a life that's contrary to God's nature and to embrace his loving nature and all that you are saying do. And he will never fail to compel you 
And as you just yield to him and yield to him, and the Holy Spirit will help you do that. He himself is not just your transformation, but he works it by his spirit. And in the end, you will not say it was because of all your prayers or because of all your this, all that, but you say it's because his love never failed. His compassions are new every morning. And when we as a congregation carry this power, the Lord can trust us with many precious souls to come here, with prodigals to come here, and they will find that forgiveness of our Savior that lives in us as an invitation for them to return to the Lord and to find healing for their souls. And I so long for this. And I believe that our congregation is to be a great power of God unto salvation, that what lives in us and among us is so powerful that people come by the thousands because they're out there, folks, and they don't know where to go for help. And I believe the Lord wants to raise up a mighty, wonderful congregation to which he can bring many souls and you can share with them as they sit next to you your story of mercy, your story of grace, your story of God's love and faithfulness and they will say, wow, what have I got to do to have what you've got? You say, Jesus, that's all. Now, if you need forgiveness, put your hand on your heart. God knows your struggle. Pray this simple prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I repent of all my sins. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Come and live in my heart. I make you my Lord. Now, Heavenly Father, I pray for every one of us that we begin to live in such revelation as the light of your word is written in our heart and minds that we are constantly aware of your great love. And I thank you that the darkness cannot prevail. The powers of hell cannot prevail. The forces of sin cannot prevail because you are yourself sanctifying your people with your presence and power. And I bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus. And the Lord be glorious to you and powerful with you and never leave you. And by his mighty work of mercy, heal every part of your body that needs healing and strengthen you in victory. In the mighty, powerful name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Everybody have a good day. Happy Mother's Day. Amen. <laughs>